Okay. All right. So uh, I would like to welcome everybody who is on this broadcast uh, to this uh, very joyful event, which is a launch of um, Robinda Kaur's new book, brand new book, um, A Brand New Nation. Please hold it up for those who haven't seen it. Uh, there we go. Uh, I, uh, my name is Thomas Blum Hansen. I'm professor of anthropology at Stanford University. I am also, it's kind of one of the fun things I do in my life, uh, um, I'm also um, the series editor of uh, South Asia in Motion, a uh, book series we started uh, with Stanford University Press um, a number of years ago. In fact, uh, Satish Deshpande is one of the members of our editorial board. Um, we have, uh, we have a, a, a constant stream of really amazing projects and some three, four years ago, uh, I think, Ravinda came to us with a, an idea for project and we began talking about it. And, um, and as you know, many of the people who are gonna to speak today, but also probably some of those in attendance will have been part of the many conversations that uh, Ravinda has engaged in and has invited people for over the years at the University of Copenhagen and other venues and in many ways, the, the, the book is a, is, a, is a product of all these years of conversation, both with us at the press, but also in, in the book series, but also at all these seminars. So I'm extremely happy to see this book come to fruition. I think it's a very fine and worked through and thought through uh, piece of work. And so, uh, so uh, I, I say this with, with a great deal of, of joy and pride that we are able to have this in our in our book series that already has many uh, great books in it. So uh, what's going to happen now is that we're going to have a, a brief, um, uh, I'm just going to introduce the speakers and the format will be that everybody uh, will speak for up to 10 minutes. I would like you to speak a little less because it will give us a little more time for discussion at the end and have people who are in the audience ask questions or have a discussion of items or issues that come up. Uh, and, and then, uh, uh, so everybody will get these sort of five to 10 minutes uh, and then we'll open up. And, and we will go, uh, I'll present the speakers in the order that they will speak and I will also give you a sign when your time is up. So please keep an eye on me when you, uh, uh, or I'll send you a chat or something like that. If, to remind you if you're running over time. That's all we can do online. So we'll begin with um, our first speaker is Saloni Matur, who is a professor of art history at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles. Our next speaker is Satish Deshpande, who is the professor of sociology at Delhi School of Economics at Delhi University. Um, the third speaker is Sumati Ramaswamy, who is professor of history at Duke University. And then we have uh, our fourth speaker is William Mazzarella, who is professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. And the last speaker is Sri Rupa Roy, who is professor of political science and modern Indian studies at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Uh, so without further ado, um, let's open up and let's begin, Saloni. The floor is yours. Great. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear good. you. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be uh, invited uh, to, to celebrate this extraordinary book by Ravinder, but also um, to be part of such an illustrious group of responders. So I'll keep my comments very short because um, there's many uh, people to listen to. But um, let me just say that, you know, Ravinder's book is about India, um, but the societal processes that it analyzes which involved the logic of uh, spectacle, affect, authoritarianism, and of course the making of capitalist dream worlds are all too familiar to me as a reader living in Trump's America. This is therefore a very far reaching study that illuminates and historicizes the projects of branding in post reform India, but of course have uh, implications uh, beyond in a comparative frame for the moment of capitalism that we find ourselves in. It offers a very precise vocabulary through which to understand this new and uh, inherently unstable field of politics. To this end, her title, 
brand new nation is actually a conceptual proposition. And Ravinda provides an excellent excavation of these three words and their relational dynamics to one another, brand, new, and nation, in a way that really harnesses that vocabulary to uh, intellectual work. Uh, spanning discourses of history, theory, marketing, finance, economics, and branding with a degree of agility that is genuinely impressive, the book presents a strong rejection of theories of globalization that prevailed during the 1990s, which valorized the increased erosion of the nation state and celebrated a supposedly post-national world. Ravinder shows instead how the nation made, in her words, a highly choreographed, spectacular comeback and reasserted its boundaries and barriers, often in the most xenophobic of ways. What is most unprecedented, she argues, is the unabashed spectacle of alliance between economy and politics that characterizes the fraught political order of India today. The book is thus about the capitalist transformation of the post-colonial nation, but it traces these material and ideological shifts through micro spaces, such as the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, which she describes, of course, as a theater of commerce. Uh, the advertising campaigns of India shining and incredible India, or more accurately, we learn from uh, Ravinder's book, it's incredible India exclamation mark, because the exclamation mark is doing a lot of work there. Of course, the crisis of demonetization the changing role of news media and the emergence of the Aam Admi or common man as an agent of change in 21st century India. Ravinder, of course, uh, also offers a historical argument locating the foundations of this brand new nation in a number of antecedents, 16th century, 17th century ideas of enclosure, the acceleration of forces in the 19th century that crystallized, let's say at the Great Exhibition, of 1851, as well as the economic reforms of the 1990s. All of these are pivotal moments, she argues, in the making of nations into 21st century investment destinations. In chapter three, she argues for a framework of remixing involving techniques of erasure and redefinition to understand what is at stake in the transformation of symbols and sign within the new realities of the digital era her account in chapter four of how this new political order is strung from tweets and pithy slogans and electoral disenchantment and cheesy merchandise once again resonated uh, very powerful, powerfully for me in the context of Trump's America as evoking especially those uh, awful Make America Great Again hats. Those are a signature of uh, Ravinder's um, notion of the brand new nation. I am struck by the scope of this very ambitious study and by the way that Ravinder has situated a complex field of entanglements involving economic, affective, material processes, as well as history, theory, politics, and serious ethnographic work. I especially admire the methodology of what she names, quote, gate crashing, which is Ravinder's presence uh, subversive presence into the elite world of CEOs, lobbyists, hedge fund managers, and branding executives at places like Davos and so on, where she did her fieldwork over, over years and years. It is, I would like to add, a beautifully written book, uh, completely jargon-free and crystal clear, yet loaded with substantive micro-propositions at a more theoretical level. level. The book was obviously written prior to uh, the global pandemic that we are living in now. And uh, the question that I would like to um, raise for Ravinder, it relates really to the implications of your study uh, or your argument for the moment that we find ourselves in the present. So the, the, without um, taking any more time, I'll just uh, present this question. Maybe we can raise it for discussion later. What I would like to um, ask Ravinder is to reflect on how uh, the coronavirus pandemic um, might have challenged 
the kind of capitalist logic of nation as brand that you have attempted to theorize. Um, on the one hand, of course, the um, virus has been a, an incredible blow to global economies and uh, stock markets and crashes and so on um, on a global scale. And of course, India's handling on the virus has seemed to be uh, 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 something of a tarnishing of the gloss on the spectacle of the brand new nation, right? Making it less attractive as an investment destination in some sense. Um, but on the other hand, uh, one could argue that the virus has actually served to further exacerbate some of the processes that you identify in the book, um, including like say the hyper-nationalism that attaches itself to the brand new nation and of course the growth of inequalities and so on. So I guess my, my question to you is to reflect for all of us on how you think uh, the current moment that we find ourselves in suddenly um, might um, have implications for the kind of uh, direction of the nation that you've been theorizing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Saloni. Uh, I, I should say, I didn't mention this a, a moment ago, that of course, after the, the, the five uh, interventions here, we will give the floor to Ravinda to uh, respond, at least to some of the questions that come up. Um, so, um, but thank you, Saloni, for excellent timekeeping. The next um, speaker is Satish Deshpande. The floor is yours, Satish. You are. You have to unmute yourself. There we go. Yes, I, I keep forgetting this, even though we are being taught this every day now. You're not the uh, only there's one. So, <laughs> there's so little to celebrate these days that it's as a sense of relief that we have something to celebrate in Ravinder's book, and I'm very happy to be here as part of that. And particularly we here in India have become a little frog in the well like. We are so preoccupied with what is happening immediately around us and uh, our immediate uh, neighborhood, so to speak, uh, has uh, manages to capture our attention by being interesting and eventful uh, all the time in, in, in all sorts of challenging ways. So it's, it's good to come across this event, this, this book, which sort of opens us up again, uh, which opens windows, so to speak, on the rest of the world. I want to begin by saying that this is a brave book. It might sound a very sort of a large thing to say, but I think it's a brave, it's, a, it's an act of courage because Ravinder is facing what I believe so many of us across the world are seeing as the central question today. And that the central question being, how did we get here? How did we get here from uh, neoliberalism and uh, talk of a borderless globalization to this new kind of uh, neoliberalism on steroids, so to speak, with hyper-nationalism, authoritarian populism, and so on? How did this happen? Uh, and uh, to face this question is, uh, takes courage today, and, and, and I uh, admire Ravinder for having done that. There are many of us looking for answers and the process is, as, as we say, the struggle is on. And uh, this is a valuable contribution to that collective struggle to make sense of uh, the new kinds of links that seem to be ma being made between economy and um, nationalism. So I have three um, points of entry or uh, points of engagement with Ravinder's book. Uh, I will quickly mention them. The first is, uh, it's, it's really uncanny how uh, Ravinder's book appears to be like in those Hindi movies, um, you know, a long lost uh, twin of uh, an essay that I had written nearly three decades ago, uh, which is called Imagined Economies, where I had uh, speculated this was uh, written in the early 1990s and published in 93, just when this process was beginning, the liberalization process. And I had argued there that the economy uh, has always supplied uh, important discursive resources for imagining the nation and that Indian nationalism has in different ways utilized those resources. First in the idea of an enslaved economy under col colonialism, then in the idea of an enshrined economy under Nehruvianism as um, the, the centerpiece of the 
sacred task of nation building and so on, all themes which appear in Ravinder's book as well. And then I had said that in the, we are talking the early 1990s here, that the new phase that we had entered of liberalization and globalization, the economy was being evacuated and that it would no longer be able to supply the discursive resources for imagining the nation that it was, that it had supplied before. This is how, this is literally how I ended. And here we have Ravinder's book, which is showing us how precisely how uh, the economy is once again uh, fueling ideas of nationalism uh, in a particular way, in, in, a, in, a very, uh, in, a, in a very contextual, very specific way. Uh, and the way that she talks about new kinds of affective investment that the economy is, uh, is inviting uh, and the ways in which things outside of the economy are driving ideas of the economic are, I think, very, very uh, fertile. And uh, I think we will, uh, we will benefit a lot from this. Uh, I think what also uh, Ravinder's book points to and uh, the, the, the kind of stage we have reached from the rather now in retrospect simplistic ideas that my essay had uh, is about this bizarre conjuncture of the present where both in the polity and the economy, we have this juxtaposition of extreme opacity and extreme transparency. The economy has become more opaque than it has ever been. And yet the results of the economic are more transparent than they have ever been in, in the form of rising inequality across the globe, which everyone is talking about. And similarly in, in, in the polity, uh, particularly here in India, we are in an in a extended state of mystification as to the political grammar that we had learned has simply gone out the window. We don't know how the political process is working, how the electoral process is working. And yet the consequences of this are more clear and sharp than they have ever been. Uh, and some of those consequences are talked about in uh, running this book as well. So um, this is the sense in which I believe that this is the critical site for questions to be asked uh, of our present. And uh, it is, uh, it is, it, 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 it's a great thing that um, Ravinder's book has um, occupied this space and is engaged in this space. Uh, the second um, point of entry or point of engagement I had thought of was again as a, I kept remembering when I was looking at Ravinder's book of this um, Turkish writer and journalist's book, A.J. Temel Kuran's book, How to Lose a Country. Uh, I happened to read that this was published only last year and I happened to read it. And it's, uh, one could think of it as a kind of, you know, a sister volume, if you like, which presents the uh, complementary part of the story. Uh, Ejit uh, Temel Quran is talking about how people like herself, liberals and broadly on the left and so on, uh, intellectuals in, in Turkey watched it in helpless uh, disbelief as their country was taken over. And uh, she, the point that she's making in her book is that this is not about Turkey alone, that this is, this is happening in country after country in the world, uh, where we keep saying, no, they can't do that this can't happen. Uh, and lo and behold, it happens. And uh, the, the political process runs away from us and its consequences um, trap us in, 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 in a very peculiar kind of helplessness that uh, associated with an unanswerable kind of anxiety. And that's, that's the kind of uh, situation we find ourselves here. And I was wondering uh, if um, Raminda would have any comments on that because this is uh, this is a kind of parallel process to what is happening. Uh, Temel Kubran's book doesn't say much about the economy, but uh, it's uh, the third uh, very, very uh, immediate in every sense uh, point of entry is uh, again, made, it made me think of uh, Ravinder's book made me think of it in a different light. Uh, as, as many of you may be aware, uh, there is a concerted attempt going on in Delhi these days uh, for over the past few months uh, to claim that there has been a conspiracy on the part of 
leftist or and liberal intellectuals who were uh, supporting the um, movement against the um, Citizenship Amendment Act, the CAA Act, and the National Register of Citizens, the NRC Act, that they were part of a conspiracy that hatched a plot to cause the violence that happened in Delhi in late February. And a striking aspect of the police narrative, striking and persistent aspect of it, is that the claimed motive for this conspiracy, and this has been reported again and again, the claimed motive for this conspiracy is that these people, these conspirators, wanted to bring the nation into disrepute at the time of Donald Trump's visit to India. So to put it in terms of Ravinder's book, this is a strategic move being made by the regime, which not only has, as Ravinder has so eloquently described, turned the nation into a brand, but it has gone further on the political side to turn the leader into the nation, uh, more than just synecdoche, a kind of condensation, a, a kind of a bringing together of the leader and nation. And the, the, why was this need felt to mention this particular reason as a motive for this, uh, for this deep conspiracy that is being claimed and for which uh, teachers uh, from universities and students and so on are continuing, as we speak, they're continually being called in for questioning. So my, the thought that this left me with and why I thought of this in, in, uh, in relation to Ravinder's book is that, uh, this is the inward face of the brand. This is the inside protesting possible tarnishing of the brand. Do we see it as that? Is that, and the fact that the brand is known to exist and is associated with the great leader and so on, is that the reason to strategically place this in this narrative? That conspirators are those who are working to tarnish this brand that our leader has so painstakingly and so miraculously built up. Uh, so I leave this as, as, as an open-ended question. It just struck me as one possible reason why this otherwise somewhat strange insistence uh, in the police narrative is, uh, is happening. So um, there are uh, so many other things that I would have uh, liked to have said about this, which, uh, this book, which is uh, very close to my heart in terms of bringing uh, economy and uh, culture together. Uh, but I will stop here and uh, I look forward to further discussions of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satish. Uh, and um, it was right on 10 minutes, so great. Uh, Sumati, your turn. Thank you. And I'm actually going to be sharing my screen. So if you could bear with me for just a second. I hope I have this correctly set up. Um, can folks see it? See the screen? Great. Okay. So in the beginning for Ravinder in this project, it's not so much the word, but the image. As she writes in the concluding pages of her book, her project began as a fascination with the publicity images of India Inc. She writes that she became enchanted with the colorful images of the India story or the new India that were mobilized on both the national and global scales of publicity. These images produced a sense of India vastly different from the India she, or for that matter I, grew up in and with as, quote, an alluring land of promise and potential, brimming with optimism and opportunity, a resource-rich nation of enterprising people, an ancient civilizational culture, fast morphing into an economic powerhouse, end quote. Image and image work, therefore, are central to the arguments of this book, so my reflections today are focused on the role these have played in what Ravinder calls the grand makeover of India in the decades immediately following liberalization. As I read my comments, 
I'll be flashing through many of the images that Ravinder has valuably accumulated for us. In fact, one of the important contributions of this project is to salvage these pictures and posters from what Walter Benjamin might have well called the rubbish heap of history and bring them to our renewed attention through her nuanced analysis. Alas, these stunning images have been reproduced only in black and white in the book, robbing them of the glorious color, sheen and gloss that also contribute to and drive their seductive allure. Fundamentally, the three campaigns of India Inc. that Ravinder focuses upon as attempting the grand makeover are at their heart image-driven campaigns. India everywhere, incredible India, and India shining. Correctly pushing against a simplistic and reductionistic reading of such images as propaganda, the book presents them instead as a rich archive of knowledge, but also very importantly with an argument as a repository of collective dreams. So what kind of knowledge are these images producing and for whose benefit? as importantly, whose dreams? And relatedly, what sort of visions of collective nightmares are also produced in their way as counter images? I offer these questions as discussion points for us that we can turn to, but for now, focus on three general observations drawing upon my own disciplinary subject position as a historian of India. First, in contrast to the popular visual culture of the 20th century that so many of us have written about, where images were critical to nation building, the images of India Inc. are engaged in the project of what Ravinder characterizes as nation branding, and as Saloni has discussed as well. While the images of the 20th century are essentially about the birth of the nation after liberation from centuries of colonial rule, the images of India Inc. from this century so far are all about the growth of the nation and economic growth at that, something that perhaps William's comments will pick up on as well. Interestingly, both projects announce the arrival of a new India. So technically and correctly speaking, India 2.0 is really new, new India. Strikingly, the chief protagonists of old new India Gandhi, Nehru, Mother India, are totally absent from the productions of India Inc., at least as manifest in these three campaigns that Ravinder's book is focused upon. Nor do we see in these images what Sanjay Srivatsava has astutely called the five-year plan hero, the scientist, the doctor, the engineer, the bureaucrat or technocrat, or even the farmer at the tractor. Instead, we have a focus on the citizen as happy investor and global consumer. So the citizen is no longer pictured as uh, living and dying for the, oh, excuse me, I speed it up. So instead, the citizen is no longer pictured as living and dying for the nation, as was frequently the case in the image cultures of India 1.0, but instead as buying and selling on behalf of the nation and in investing in India. This is what constitutes national service in the time of India Inc. As Ravinder observes, brand India campaigns were always presented as a form of personal and professional homage to the nation. Second, and building upon this observation, what I see at work is the intense iconophilia of India Inc in love with images and with the relentless flow and makeover of images. Beautiful and alluring, but also witty and smart. I use the term iconophilia in the sense that Bruno Latour does. That is to say, iconophilia is regard not necessarily for the image per se or image qua image, but for the movement of image, the passage, the transition from one form to another. We get numerous instances of this iconophilia in Ravinder's analysis, and I have my favorites. An example from early in the book is an ad that was released 
by the Ministry of Finance in 2003 that so cleverly repurposes history, myth, and the trope of discovery using the image of the master discoverer of the old times, Columbus. As Ravinder notes, in this image, Columbus is summoned back from the archives of history, dusted off and redeployed to convince a new audience that India was once again a desirable place and an available commodity. Five centuries and more of colonial rule and immiseration and post-colonial mismanagement well behind it. It is indeed open for business. A similar iconophilia is at work in the fantastic image making of the Incredible India campaign, which put on ample display a confident, prosperous, post-exotic India, but which also cleverly uh, uh, embraced the accumulated stereotypes leveled against it over the centuries and turned them on their head, literally in this case, uh, with good humor, but also insight regarding what the global consumer is looking for. Here, Ravinder's uh, analysis, especially of the appropriation of the graphic image of the exclamation mark for the cause of India, Inc., is masterful. The only thing I would add here is that it is sheer love for image making and image moving, in other words, iconophilia, that I think is also at work here. My final observations have to do with smart images and poor images, and a paradox that Ravinder's work has revealed to me. The brand makers of India Inc, as Ravinder tells us, are in search of the smart image. The term smart itself is something she encountered repeatedly in her numerous conversations with them. The smart image is the image of good times, a chedin, and especially one that redirects the foreign gaze so as to correct the image of India as a third world poor country. Here again, the gloss and the color and the happy shining faces of the images of these campaigns play an enormously productive role. Let us contrast these images with the counter images produced by the India whining folks, grim and grainy, bleak and blurry, hearkening back to India 1.0. And yet for all their smartness, the images of brand India are poor images, not in the sense of how Hito Starl has recently re defined a poor image as one whose quality is bad, whose resolution is substandard, a rag or a rip. These images are also not poor in the sense that once produced and released into the global flow, they are in fact abandoned and they're forced quite spent in the relentless movement of what journalist Adam Roberts has called superfast primetime ultimate nation. As I noted at the beginning, Ravinder has had, uh, has had to play quite the role of the Benjaminian chiffonier and troll through the detris detritus of the digital world to locate all these uh, fantastic images. But what I mean about these smart images being poor is the enormous amount of textual and discursive labor they, they've also to undertake to get their message across. In contrast to the visual culture of India 1.0, where the map of India or the image of Mother India or of Gandhi and Nehru where, where, where would suffice, were you know, able to do the work, these brand makers of India 2.0 would elaborate lens to supplement their images with words and in English at that in order to reach their audience. So iconophilic they may be, but in the end, the very nature of the images they have produced show their lack of faith in the power of the image and its work. And perhaps an implicit mm -hmm. recognition that images can indeed be treacherous and can turn on one. This is after all the lesson of the shining images of the India Shining campaign, which may well have played a critical role in unseating the party in power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was just about to uh, intercede as you were wrapping up. Thank you, Sumati. All right. Uh, the 
Next speaker is William Mazzarella. Please go ahead. Thank yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ravinder, for the book. It seems really only yesterday that we were walking through Copenhagen and talking about some of the very earliest ideas of this project. So to see it now fully formulated in such an impressive way is, is really both moving um, and, and very compelling. So congratulations. I'm going to uh, speak, I think, for about eight minutes or so. Um, should be well within the time frame. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, spend these few minutes reflecting on a theme that runs through Ravinder's wonderful book, and it is this. In order to understand the political and the commercial stakes of nation branding, Ravinder suggests that we have to pay attention to the relation between the things that can be expressed in economic terms, on the one hand, and the things that can only be expressed in terms that exceed the economic, on the other hand. A one way of putting this would be to say that it's a question of what can be commodified and what resists commodification. But to put it that way doesn't get at the intimacy, the intensity, and the ambivalence of the relation. It's not just that there's an element of the brand that goes beyond economy. No, it's a stronger claim that Ravinder is making. The claim is that it's the part that goes beyond economy that animates the economy. So just to take the central example of Ravinder's book, The Nation Brand. At one level, she observes, the nation brand is a commodity. It can be marketed. Its value can even at some speculative level be expressed in numbers or in relation to numbers like GNP. It can be understood as reflecting and at the same time enhancing the value of the nation brand. But at another level, and this is true of all brands, the nation brand has to contain or index something that is beyond exchange, something powerful and yet ineffable, perhaps a kind of sublime object, something that irradiates the commodity with a light whose source is not for sale. It's relatively easy to see how this works with the nation brand because the very idea of the nation has, as Ravinder and so many other people on this uh, panel uh, reminds us, for so long, the very idea of the nation has for so long had this kind of sublime quality. We can feel it, sometimes feel it intensely, but it's also a kind of inalienable transcendent substance, something that can't be bought or sold. One of the implications of this, as Ravinder points out, is that there's actually no contradiction between globalizing markets and chauvinistic politics. Not only is there no contradiction, but chauvinistic politics may in fact be one of the most effective ways in which to perform branding and closure on a global market. The specific moment that Ravinder explores in the book is one in which the Indian nation brand has become inextricable from Modi-style authoritarian populism. Now, clearly this is not the only way in which the nation brand in India has found political expression, but it is worth asking, I think, whether there's something about the kind of claim to collective substance that a nation brand makes, and the parallel claims to the true substance of the people that populist affect involves. And when I say populist, I want to keep on the table the possibility, of course, that populism isn't just a right-wing or chauvinistic phenomenon. One place to begin thinking about this, and it's a place that interests Ravinder in the book, is that place where that which is beyond economy gets expressed in anti-instrumental terms. So we know we're in the presence of a sublime object when self-interest or economic utility moves to the background as a motivation. At the extreme, this might mean that someone is ready to die for the nation, but at a less exalted level, it's also what shimmers through when Ravinder's advertising informants tell her regarding the nation branding work they're doing, we don't do this for money. Although here, knowing the ad world as I do, I'd say they may sincerely not be doing it for the money, but the prestige of awards is never far from their minds. Ravinder does a lovely job of showing how the India Adda at Davos, the space in which people are invited simply to hang out and imbibe the essence of Indian hospitality, confronts the problem of utility and what exceeds utility. On the one hand, the whole India Adda operation is an exercise in business networking. And here, the principle is that economic self-interest is suspended or deferred. You don't, get, you don't network in order to, to secure some particular advantage. On the other hand, there's no point in networking if you think it's not going to open up advantages down the line. Ravinder shows us the gently brutal logic through which those who do not appear to be prospectively profitable, 
in that scene are either ignored or actively ejected. But there's also something else going on with the invocation of Adda, namely the idea that economy can only be secured and nurtured by something that exceeds economy, a willingness to suspend instrumental considerations so as to nurture other kinds of inspirations and attachments. Again, we're familiar with this kind of thinking from the world of business, especially from those corners of it that are preoccupied with things like ideation, creativity, thinking outside the box and other such nostrums. Here, brainstorming is often undertaken on the understanding that it's only when you let go of directly instrumental ways of approaching a problem that the solution will appear to you. Again, the structure is not exactly anti-utilitarian, but it involves a kind of suspended or deferred utilitarianism. Parenthetically, and perhaps pathetically even, this is of course also the way that liberal arts education is often justified in a neoliberal world. The capacity to think laterally, to engage aesthetically rather than instrumentally, will ultimately lead to boosting the bottom line. Now, Terry Eagleton once made a dialectical argument that I've always been very fond of. It goes something like this. Any ruling order, any political dispensation, needs to ground itself in affective and aesthetic experience in order to be politically effective. And yet, that affective and aesthetic ground of the political is always going to exceed and trouble the certainties of that ruling order, that political dispensation. In a way, it's a romantic and hopeful argument because it suggests that the very means by which power grounds itself is also the terrain of its undoing. And in fact, I've come to think it's a bit more complicated than that. Nowadays, I tend to think that the gap between a ruling order and its effective grounds is as likely to be precisely the fascinating thing, the thing that keeps us coming back like moths to a flame, as it is likely to be a place of resistance. Or perhaps I'd put it this way, that uneasy and yet crucial spot where economy and that which is beyond economy are tied up in each other, it's like a symptom. It's a place of repetition and stuckness as well as of the kind of energy where we feel that we can be ourselves most intimately, precisely in our repetitions. And it is, just like a symptom, a place where something deep can be transformed and reworked. Ravinder cites Marshall McLuhan at one point, and that reminded me that there's a place in Understanding Media, McLuhan's book, where McLuhan writes something that feels relevant to Ravinder's discussion. McLuhan writes, ads are news, what is wrong with them is that there are always good news. Ravinder similarly and rightly remarks on that unsettling way in which the business and ad world involves a kind of compulsory optimism. And I think the point here has to be that if something is always good news, it doesn't just mean that you're not showing the bad news. It doesn't just mean that the picture is incomplete. It means that you've identified a symptomal point, a point where intense affects are clustered because that's why the ad or the nation brand or the political ideology resonates. But at the same time, by insisting on cheerful can-do optimism, you're ignoring the darker drives that necessarily live in any symptom or not. Here's what, here what goes beyond economy, what goes beyond self-interest, takes on decidedly more sinister tones. This isn't just about self-sacrifice in the interest of something larger than yourself. It's also about the murderous violence that erupts when you're unable to face the darkness in yourself and the self-destruction that follows close on its heels. Part of the powerful provocation of Ravinder's book is that it asks us to look squarely at that place where affect meets economy, for better or for worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. Excellent timekeeping. Uh, our last commentator, speaker, is Super Roy. It's all yours. You have to unmute yourself. I, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. And especially thank you to Ravinder for writing this wonderful book and, you know, giving us a chance to, to come together. I've been finding it particularly wonderful to be able to discuss the 21st century nation with so many 20th century friends. So thank you for that. Um, so what I'll do today in my time is um, I'd like to talk about a cup of one of Ravinder's chapters, the one that 
William uh, mentioned as well, which is um, chapter five, Magical Markets, and uh, talk about a couple of really intriguing insights um, in this chapter. And uh, as we've heard, the chapter is based in Davos in Switzerland um, at an annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, I believe. The bulk of the chapter focuses on the meeting in 2011, and although Ravinder has made many visits, um, many research visits um, to this event. And the chapter centers on Ravinder's experiences at the Indian Adda, or the hangout lounge space that was created in a cafe in Davos by the Indian Brand Equity Foundation, which is a government agency. It's formerly, a, I believe it's a trust under the Ministry of Commerce uh, that was established in the early 2000s. And you know, through this chapter, what Ravinder does is she gives us a, a very close, a ringside view of an event that rarely, I mean, we have a lot of media coverage about uh, the World Economic Forum, but um, very little of this kind of first-hand critical and academic analysis. So in some ways, reading this chapter, what we learn, I think, is, is, is you know, Brand India is only one part of what, what we are getting to learn about. There's the much broader phenomenon of global elite formation that is also really spotlighted in this chapter. And, you know, among the many things um, that are going on here, let me just uh, highlight two things that I find uh, particularly interesting, uh, which come out most clearly in this chapter, but I think, um, you know, come out through the book, um, the, the rest of the book as well. The first is um, Ravinder's discussion here really, I think, invites us to think about what publicity, publicness, and spectatorship might mean in this moment of um, that she terms uh, the nation branding moment. Um, who is the audience and who is the public exactly that Brand India is addressing? Um, who is this spectacle of the brand new nation being performed for? This question kept coming up as I was uh, reading the book and the Davos example made it quite clear that um, we're not talking about the ordinary citizen or the national masses anymore. So unlike these mass national and ordinary publics that were addressed by the earlier project of nation building, what Sumati uh, referred to as New India 1.0, um, nation branding addresses, um, and, and you know, the Davos chapter kind of really makes this clear, a highly selective and what we might call an invitational public. And that's why I think her metaphor of gate crashing is, is, is particularly apt. Um, the World Economic Forum only has around 3,000 guests, which is less than the attendance at an annual Association of Asian Studies conference. Um, so this is, this is the kind of nature of the public that we are talking about. Um, how is this invitational public to be addressed? Is the burden then still, is it still persuasion? Is it still about belief and affect? Does convincing the investor to put her money in India and convincing the citizen to love her nation, do these work in the same way? And uh, what might the criteria of nation branding success and effectiveness be? How do nation branders evaluate whether their brand is effective? I think Ravinder's book is really pushing us to ask these questions and to rethink um, ideas of publicness, publicity, and communicative practices as such. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more from her about you know, this, this idea of publicness itself being transformed um, at this moment. Um, and then uh, just briefly, the second point that I'd like to flag again through this chapter, and this really echoes something that Satish also mentioned um, in his um, remarks um, today, uh, the chapter, uh, the Davos chapter give, and the rest of the book uh, gives us a close-up view of the state capital alliance that governs India and shows us what this actually means in material terms, the kind of relations, practices, people and spaces that uh, make and sustain this alliance. And what Ravinder is showing us, as Satish pointed out as well, is that these relations, practices and spaces are in fact very murky and shadowy. So this is really, I think, another striking and original contribution of the book. It shows us how spectacle and visibility are linked to practices of secrecy and um, opacity. 
So for instance, in the Adda itself, at the same time that the brand new nation is being performed and publicized in the public spaces of the Adda where Ravinder is along with you know, others, there are also all of these shadowy characters off stage whose transactions, of course, we are not privy to. And the Davos event at some level is about both of these things, right? It's about these, these um, um, talks and debates and forums that are televised and broadcast, but it's also about all the deals that are made on the ski slopes. Um, as Ravinder's informants describe it to her, the space of the Indian Adda has both an inside and an outside, and it's this inside that remains out of bounds and remains invisible, but nevertheless is in some ways the critical space um, of, of the Adda as well. And so the book really is showing us um, that in this era of high visibility, high publicity nation branding, we actually know very little about the decisions, the interests and the transactions that are involved. For instance, how were the Indian delegates to Davos chosen that year? Who sanctioned the five million US dollars for that Adda campaign? What are the institutional and organizational mechanisms that broker the state and business relationship? Does the uh, IBEF, the Indian Brand Equity Foundation, reflect more the organized power of a particular business lobby like the Confederation of Indian Industry? Or are there informalized and personalized relations and transactions um, that we need to talk about? And I think what we have here is a very intriguing puzzle, which is that the time of capitalism's triumph and moral legitimacy in India, as, as Ravinder has mapped for us, is also a time when the transactions of state and capital continue to be obscured and unaccountable. So, you know, we're all very familiar with the secretive and murky transactions of rent seeking in pre-liberalization India, what has been described as the era of corrupt uh, briefcase politics, right? When uh, it was all about bribes um, and um, politicians receiving campaign funds, license and permits for entrepreneurs being secured through bribes. What has replaced briefcase politics? What kinds of secrecies and opacities proliferate in post-liberalization India? And, and why, if the state capital partnership enjoys social and moral uh, sanction and legitimacy today, unlike in the past. So although she's not framing it in this way, I think one of the very significant contributions of the book is to show us the informalized and networked relations of power that govern India today and the emergence and consolidation of what Asima Sinha has described as the porous state, where state and capital um, cannot be thought of as separate domains and entities that influence each other, but are intimately entangled. Um, so, so let me just end with this, and I'd like to hear on this front more from Ravinder about her encounters with opacity and secrecy during her research and, and, and some, some more about the shadows um, that were cast by the brand new nation. So I'll end here and thank you again. Thank you very much, Rupa, uh, and yeah, well, thank you, thank you to all the panelists. I should say that we are spread across what three, four different time zones in the world. So we are fortunate, in some ways, that we can do this in spite of all the challenges that the present situation presents. So thank you for making time, Ravinda. You have about ten minutes okay. to. Okay. Can you or, or less, depending on how much time you would like to take, but up to 10 minutes to respond, pick up some of the threats um, and the points, and then we'll open for questions for, from the, as far as I can see, 145 people who are attending this event. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I think, first of all, I really have to thank you so much because everyone who is here has been part of my journey, the discoveries that I have been making uh, in many ways. And, uh, and I'm really pleased that you could assemble on this platform across time zones, uh, especially, I mean, people from Silicon Valley, I'm indebted to you for waking up at 6.30 in the morning <laughs> to do this. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is to, first of all, I must also say what this book is not about, because recently on social media, I'm being contacted by a lot of uh, branding consultants, because I think a lot of people think I've written a book on branding, 
which is a kind of manual. <laughs> so I just want to make it clear that it is actually not a branding manual. So, but somehow it has um, uh, my book on some Amazon list is being listed as a branding book. So, but uh, in any case, I think what I'm going to do is to uh, like just two or three things like which have been pointed out also as questions. I think perhaps I can begin with you, Saloni. Uh, you know, where you said that what implications, uh, you know, the work that I have been doing has for this current situation, you know, like when we are all sitting at home uh, or locked in our offices. I mean, um, of course, I think for me, uh, you know, coming from, you know, the work that I have been doing, what has been very clear is that the kind of dichotomy that we play around with, a lot of political commentators play around with, which is globalization versus uh, the rise of nationalism. And each, uh, you know, each time we speak about the return of nationalism or the rise of Modi, rise of Trump, and many, you know, Satish mentioned, you know, the Turkish case. So it is, uh, you know, done that with a little bit of shock that how could this even take place? How could this even happen? But what I'm trying to show is that, well, if you actually look at the ways in which state capital relations play out, you know, what Shirupa has also been trying to focus on, I mean, what you see is that you would be surprised at all to see that, uh, that this kind of language or, uh, you know, this dichotomy simply does not explain what is happening today. Because, uh, you know, this particular kind of formation of the nation as an enclosure for capital, this is not opposed to what people think, you know, globalization or this movement, free, you know, capital movement. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there are many movements here, but I'm specifically looking at capital is not being stopped from movement. There are many other things which have stopped. But this is certainly not uh, being stopped. I mean, one example that I will give you is that right now, as you know, China is displaced from its seat as factory of the world, or at least there is an effort to do so. There are many other countries which are competing precisely to do that. So the idea that somehow, uh, you know, this current crisis, I mean, the pandemic has so sort of, uh, you know, created a particular kind of, uh, you know, just a nationalist, you know, and by when people invoke nationalism, they are thinking about somehow closed, inward looking. But this is not what is really happening. So I think the whole, because as you know, countries like India have made a very, very strong pitch uh, to become this alternative. And in a way, none of this is surprising because these are old trends that India and China rivalry is very, very well known you know, the dragon and the elef elephant kind of uh, rivalry. And India, what it hopes to do is to displace China, right? Whether it does or not is a separate question, but the form, for the moment, this is the struggle which is going on. So I think if uh, uh, I will continue, uh, you know, like, you know, what Satish has been, uh, you know, uh, which also connects to what Satish, uh, Satish was mentioning, that this kind of disbelief that people sit with, you know, it is because there is this inherent, uh, notion. I mean, people actually did buy this idea that, uh, you know, liberal markets and liberal politics go hand in hand. When they don't have to. I mean, uh, th this, is, this is not a surprising revelation in any way, but this is the myth people have bought and they continue, I mean, like, despite strong evidence being there to the contrary, uh, you know, there is like, you know, I mean, just you can see what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that market itself can be capitalized to produce political results. And I think the uh, you know, rise of Modi in Indian politics is the perfect example of what we are trying to uh, show here. Uh, namely that uh, you know, when um, you know, Modi comes to power, basically on the promise of Ache Din, uh, which is combining Hindu nationalism you know, with uh, high economic growth, uh, uh, he comes to power, but what in reality what is happening today is that uh, he has been able to position his particular brand of politics by capitalizing on the promise of economic growth. Now, everybody who knows Indian economy, they know that the, the situation is pretty, uh, a little bit fragile, right? And the, and the, you know, uh, the forecasts are not looking good either. But despite that, there is, uh, there is a particular kind of, uh, you know, political consensus which has been built based on the promise. And this is, I think, very, 
you know, which reminds me of this, you know, this optimism or what William was mentioning, you know, this permanent cheerfulness, permanent good news, you know, that uh, how do you even explain the current economic crisis without not thinking about the non-economic part, which you were mentioning, William, which is to, you know, this, this, there is this effective politics which goes on all the time, which is prim primarily, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, founded upon this hope, this optimism that this will happen. So the funny thing is that there is no deadline that when precisely this will happen, right? So there is, this is permanently different. And even though we all know that we have only one life to live, you know, the fulfillment of that promise, but that entire economy or that effective economy continues on a promise which may or may not be fulfilled. Because how else are we going to explain uh, you know, the current situation in India, because the political scientists, many political scientists have a very straightforward way of uh, making sense of politics. Namely to say, well, he did not fulfill the promise, but now the whole government should fall. But 2019, this did not happen. And there was a lot of head scratching going on. So how did this happen? So I think in that case, we need to understand the ways in which this particular kind of effective politics is taking shape, where economy and politics, they are not in this, you know, old fashioned way where it is all about, well, if you did not fulfill the promise, we will vote you out. There is this promise, there is this hope, and that is where publicity comes in, you know, very, very strongly. So I think um, I will like, um, I, I don't know if I'm able to, uh, you know, pick up everything. I think which of course connected to this is the state capital relations, you know, and sometimes I wonder why do we even think that way? Because if you have seen this kind of interaction, which I have been witnessing, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs, the capitalists, the captains of industry, and between bureaucrats, ministers, influencers, you know, then, then it is, it's like my, you know, like we are speaking about the elite who are interconnected in more ways than one, you know, and uh, what of course can happen is that that kind of dynamic can change from time to time. That, that, that certainly happens. And some of the things I'm recounting are from 2012. And this is two years before, uh, you know, uh, BJP government comes in. But what you can see already is the ways in which India Inc, so to say, is um, rooting for a strong leader, you know? And what I'm describing at India Adda is also, you know, the kind of, um, or throughout the book, the kind of discomfort there is, which William has also, you know, like noted here, the kind of discomfort which is permanently present about branding or commodifying something like a nation. And I think this kind of discomfort I have seen uh, even among people who do the branding. And this is why, you know, I mean, like constantly there is this need to say, no, no, but we are doing this as a form of national service, you know? And of course there are a hundred ways to interpret what this actually means, but what it shows is this anxiety constantly with this project. And as I think, um, uh, I don't know if many people know that, uh, you know, the guru of uh, uh, nation branding, Simon Anhalt, uh, he actually at some point gave up on the project. So I interviewed him, uh, you know, uh, for this project, just on email. And I think he was sort of distancing himself from the whole thing, you know, because I think by the time this, uh, you know, this had become a, you know, kind of formula which can be implemented everywhere, that all you had to do is to get hold of an ad agency, which is going to make glossy posters and say, we are open for business and there you go. And I think the entire, you know, lots of like running a nation, an entire population and looking after you know, this old fashioned things about, you know, what are we going to do with standards of living? What about health, employment, nutrition, those kind of things, you know, boring stuff. So I think it was, it is like interesting that how even within the community, uh, you know, that it has always been a little bit of like, ah, that there's like, there's this discomfort that, you know, you don't know what to do with this, 
right? Because you're constantly trying to capitalize something which is beyond capital because you're supposed to love it. So, so which is why it leads to very funny situations also where people say all sorts of, uh, you know, actually um, fun stuff about uh, or how to express your love for the nation in this particular moment. I'll just stop here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I see we have a, a couple of questions rolling in, so I will just read them out. And, um, and we can, they are both for, for you, Ravinda, but they also, I think we can take comments or questions or, or answers or reactions from, from anyone on the panel. So the first one here is from uh, Sarabjit, I think. Uh, as far as I can see the, the name here, the question goes, do you think the current state we find ourselves in, that of hypernationalism and seemingly broken democratic systems the world over, has come about because the liberal democratic system didn't work as advertised, at least not for everyone? Perhaps the reinvention of a nation brand that selectively draws upon national history and culture is a more relatable one for the masses. And so the brand shapes the nation question mark. Ravinda? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think perhaps this, well, I'm not sure, like, uh, the brand shapes the nation, or let's put it this way, at least the hope is that the brand will shape the nation, meaning that some of these images that we are looking at, or some of these, you know, these good news uh, kind of discourse that we witness, it is also pedagogical in some way that this is, this is how you ought to be. And I think here I'm reminded of like, you know, Sumiti, uh, you know, was mentioning the image frame that she was focusing on. And I think, uh, you know, you spoke about counter images, for example, and iconophilia and so on and so forth. And I was thinking at the time that actually one of, you know, one service, the ways in which you can, you know, serve the nation is by being, by remaining invisible, by being absent from the image. You know, so as you know, in, in the world of social media, there are many clashes which take place that uh, people are showing wrong kind of images. They should not do it because the right kind of images which ought to be shown, and this is where it comes, you know, brand shaping the nation, national identity. It is that, uh, you know, all these images about poverty or ill health, or in these days, whether Corona figures are too low, you know, whether, uh, you know, what is the real situation? Is it bad? Or the government says, no, no, the recovery rate is going very well, right? So it is all about that your job is, of course, the best kind of, you know, the right kind of citizens are those who either have something to invest or some, you know, buying, selling, that kind of thing. But those who can't do that, you know, the least they can do is to remain out, to remain invisible, you know? So I think this, this uh, I think I particularly remember, you know, uh, all of us have seen those images of, uh, you know, migrants walking home, uh, you know, sometimes in early April, late March, you know, when the lockdown uh, was brought in. There was huge amount of outcry that why is it that the world media is showing these, these images? You know, and I think what was the most amazing thing was that for a lot of, uh, you know, middle class people in, in Indian cities and abroad, of course, as well, there was a complete sense of disbelief and shock that where were these all, all these people all along? They too exist, you know? So I think this thing about it's that brand or the frame that we are speaking about, it's not just about what is visible, but what is, of course, uh, you know, photoshopped out, but also you're expected to remain out, just remain invisible out of that. So in that sense, I would say that in the, that case, of course, uh, brand is, or, or this imagery is pedagogical in some way, that it tells you that how you ought to be. Thank you. Uh, I can see we have quite a few more questions are rolling in. So should we take the next one or are there anyone else on the panel who would like to come in here? There are lots of other questions coming. So you'll have your chance. Okay, so uh, the next one is from uh, Santosh Ray. Um, 
it goes like this. Recently, after 5th August, some scholars have uh, called this new India uh, as an emergence of a second republic. So is it possible that a political party with a share of just 34 to 36 percent of polled votes and backed by a rightist cultural group is capable of forming a majoritarian republic? Or is it just being done in the realm of the virtual world and image formation with corporate support? Mm. Anyone would like to uh, weigh in on that one? Satish? Yeah, I, the short answer is that the 64% who did not vote are also an achievement of the Modi regime. <laughs> So we need to look at it. There's no just about this 34% or 36%. It's, uh, it's a much larger phenomenon and that's what we are, trying to, we are trying to understand. And I think the social sciences in India have not recovered from the sh shock of demonetization. Leave alone the economy, social scientists have not recovered from the shock of demonetization. And our shock was that things that were bound to happen, we felt were bound to happen because of that didn't happen. And um, the reason why they didn't happen is why this is not just 34%. Anyone else who want to weigh in? We have a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, Sumati? And, yeah, and I would also say um, that the last question, the, the final question in that uh, comment, um, the raises the question of the power of the image itself, right? It doesn't, be, something being done just in the realm of image suggests that the image is marginal or is um, a supplement, whereas one could argue, uh, and actually, you know, Ravinder sent me this uh, news from a couple of days ago about the Modi government trying to do a major image makeover, correct? Again, in the wake of the pandemic, and we know also, as she mentioned, you know, that the negative images coming out of India around the, especially the question of the migrant, how the opposition to it uh, from those who actually uh, within India, especially in the artistic world, who have tried to bring it to, you know, to the fore, how they have actually been uh, targeted on social media, asked to take down, you know, images that actually uh, project a negative sense of India. So I don't think an image is ne ever just adjust, right? It is, it is doing an enormous amount of work uh, and often leads uh, uh, and doesn't necessarily only follow. So that's another way I would complicate that very interesting observation. Okay, thank you. And sorry, if I could just add one thing, which I yes. think is that one of the great strengths of Ravinder's argument is that it uh, pushes back on this notion that there's a realm of images and then there's kind of a realm of real politics underneath right. it, right? right. Uh, and, and this has often been kind of like a, an easy way in which to kind of reject the, the space of public cultural imaging, the space of advertising, etc., to just suggest that it's a kind of superficial epiphenomenal structure that like hides what's really going on underneath. And I think, uh, you know, Ravinder's book gives us tools for thinking about the kind of the mutual imbrication of what we think of as kind of the visual realm and, and the political realm. So, yeah. All right. So again, and images are never just images. Constitutive nature, Thank right? Thank Essential you. constitutive nature of the image work and the visual world. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the next one uh, from Arvin Beach in uh, Toronto. Uh, Asking Ravinda, will we see more of the same in the next general election? That is a disconnect between results and electoral results, I suppose, between economic outcomes and electoral results. I mean, a crystal ball. Of course. Crystal I mean, <laughs> and, and so obviously it. we don't know, but I think what we do know is that um, given the current situation in India, uh, the political situation. Uh, I mean, given the fact that we do not have any viable political party which is able to do, and here I think what Sumiti just mentioned is tremendously important. You know, this new image uh, operation which Modi government has launched in the wake of Corona actually to correct, you know, perceptions and correct images. 
uh, it is that uh, it's uh, it's uh, the way you mobilize public and public opinion is tremendously important in this, right? So I think this again, what I'm trying to say is that the way political science works, you know, that here now, you know, this is a set of electoral promises you didn't fulfill. Now we will throw you out because by all those measures, this government should go out. But if it does not go out, it is because something else is taking place. I think this is what we are trying to, you know, talk about with the work of the spectacle here, you know, and which is, which is not just about, as William has just said, this is not just like, again, some sort of, uh, you know, distance, you know, that we, you know, that we are speaking about. It is the ways in which the sphere of politics has been produced over here. So I think, I, of course, I don't know what is going to happen in 2024. And we also know that in India, uh, there is huge difference between what happens in state elections and in national elections. And even, you know, municipality elections can produce very different results. Right. And right. Um, without going into too much into, you know, the electoral uh, nitty gritty. I, I want to cover as many questions as we can in the time we have. We still have like 10, 15 minutes left. So let's go to the next one uh, from Anand. Um, how do you complicate the aspirations of a deeply stratified society like India? I have in mind middle classes coming together and sticking to the brand that is Hindutva. Anyone? Want to buy in on that one? Thomas, this sounds like your question. <laughs> <laughs> right, Satish, thank you. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, uh, uh, I, I think it's, there is certainly a, a consolidation of, of a certain middle class aspiration around Hindutva, but I think that middle class aspiration um, is both complex, but it's also uh, um, uh, you can say um, it's older, it predates uh, uh, Hindutva. Uh, uh, and what we see is, is that in some ways, I think the strength of, of, the Hindu, of the Hindu nationalist ideologies, two things, I'll just say this briefly. One is that it's nimble and adaptable and able to pick up and, and, and uh, um, um, incorporate lots of uh, discrete elements into this grand narrative of this nation coming into being. Um, but the, the second thing which I think is most important is that I think what, what the Hindutva brand or Hindutva as an ideology that exists in all these capillary forms across uh, towns and villages and, and organizers and activists in India is that it's been able to, in a sense, give uh, voice to and articulate uh, and incorporate many already existing forms of prejudice and desires and um, and um, uh, and aspirations uh, and give it a, a coherent vehicle. It may not last forever, but this is certainly what it has done. And I think that explains to a large extent uh, what we see this sort of uh, 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 young unemployed men who have no prospect of ever getting a job perhaps are still signing up to be part of a Hindu vigilante group or are uh, uh, supporting the idea of, of, of the nation. There is a, a wonderful book that came out some years ago uh, about the US that's called Broke and Patriotic, uh, about why poor Americans are more patriotic than, than uh, richer Americans. And uh, one could maybe think with that in terms of uh, I mean, there the author is saying that what what the nation, the Amer what American nationalism gives to poor people is a sense of importance, a sense of centrality, a sense of of grandeur, being part of something that is bigger and stronger than your your own quite miserable life. And maybe one could make a similar argument in India. That's sort of a process that's underway and that's part of the success. So I think it's not just about middle class uh, uh, consolidation. I think it's about that more that is the nation project that is promising a, a form of strength, a form of uh, uh, a membership of something that's bigger than yourself that, that lots of people are, are buying into, at least for the time being. So that would be my answer to that. Super. Yes, and just, just to, to add to that, I think it would be really interesting as a coda to this book, which obviously was, was, was finished earlier, to look at, you know, events like 
the Howdy Modi event or the Madison Square Gardens rally, which brings together the kind of brand India logic that you identify with the brand Hindutva, brand Modi logic, right? So there's a there's in a sense this kind of bigger marketplace of of branding, if you like, um, and it it just might be something to to look at as a continuation of the story. So. There is a question okay. by Amita. Um, which you I want think, to Amita Babishka? Okay. Yes, I think Amita. because she's asking, you know, that uh, is this branding also meant for consumption within India? To be yeah. open for business seems signal, uh, to signal to Indian capitalists that they can work with impunity, setting aside labor rights and environmental safeguards. I'm thinking of Adani in India and Australia getting away with environmental murder. So I think the answer to this is that uh, the thing about branding is that, of course, uh, each time, you know, and a brand agency, you know, starts making their campaigns, they are meant for specific audience. But think what we have seen is that, uh, you know, you don't control images or, you know, publicity material once you have issued it in public. You, you don't control who will end up seeing it. So in that sense, many of these campaigns that, uh, you know, we are speaking about today, they were meant for either Indian audience or meant for capitalists, you know, captains of industry abroad, but they all get blended. So in that sense, branding has become an operation which is as much uh, something, you know, which, which, you, uh, which is directed at your own population in order to mobilize them. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, very quickly to say that, yes, to work with impunity, pay attention to the fact that uh, people often speak about that, uh, you know, there is problem with structural reforms in India. One thing they would often mention is labor law. So when they speak about labor law, they're obviously not speaking about labor condition or, you know, the low wage rate or, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, people work in very dangerous conditions. When they speak about labor problem, they're speaking about the fact that, uh, that we need to remove or alter the factory acts, the old or many of these regulations, which are actually very minimum already in India, that we need to do away with it. So it's a very, very different kind of, uh, so certainly it is about giving, you know, unrestrained, like open hand, you know, where everything is seen, you know, labor itself, or, you know, in one of India's main attraction is that you can offer cheap labor, right? Or that, of course, is not just the Indian case, that's the case across the global south. So, of course, uh, so branding is a signal more than anything else uh, to a variety of audiences. Yeah. Sure. Let's take, uh, I would like you to maybe to uh, address Aditya Mohanty's question uh, saying is, uh, Aditya is asking uh, if pro-poor welfare schemes were the grammar of populism in the past, branding is the new cat in the back, but the point is how are supposedly elitist, urbane, majoritarian parties making inroads into a public psyche? Just by branding? But that's the thing. It's not just branding. Because it is a very sustained kind of... Uh, I think branding is just tip of the iceberg. I think people forget that uh, uh, there are many things, you know, the... You know, the you know, visual, digital, virtual, material, all these things are going hand in hand. Um, I think it is often forgotten that the branding operation we are speaking about, this has always been part of the economic reform, structural reforms, uh, you know, of the Indian government. Already in mid 1990s, it was started. So to call it just branding is because we just think, oh, these are just ads, right? But the thing is that this is a very, very major operation, which is just, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg and it is about molding public opinion. And this has happened over, you know, the last three decades in a very sustained manner. So of course, uh, it, and it has particularly enthused, uh, you know, the middle class. Uh, I mean, there are people here who work on middle class. I mean, um, uh, you know, people who have loved this idea of seeing, witnessing India. And as I, again, I said, this is not about the material reality just like that, but it is also the dream that one day we will be like this. So of course, this is, this is a much more weighty proposition that we are talking about here. Yes. Uh, we, anyone else who want to weigh in on this? Yes, Satish? Yeah, I just wanted to also say that 
there's all kinds of branding going on. Not only the kind that uh, Ravinder has focused on, uh, because the emergence of the new media uh, has made branding a very uh, almost uh, coterminous with politics in a way. And we are seeing all kinds of branding uh, that, that is going on for different markets. So the people who you think are being left out by the Davos kind of branding are addressed by another kind of branding. And I think uh, branding as a, as, a, as a modality uh, may be a useful one to think of these days uh, where uh, the media are so, uh, it, it's possible to concentrate the media and control it in ways that were not, uh, not possible before. Yep. Anyone else? So we can move to the next one. All right, uh, so here's uh, from Pritam Singh uh, is asking, well, on, one, on the one hand, we have all the vulnerabilities of capitalism and in increasing inequalities and ecological catastrophe. And on the other, the retreat of the left and the further strengthening of the right. How do you explain that? Well, I think, uh, I think I have to say that if we look at India, then I think the retreat of the left has taken place a long time ago. So the concerns which Pritham is mentioning, they're tremendously important, but uh, what we see with, you know, this India story or the reform story, uh, you know, or that economic growth is, you know, the ways in which to achieve that dream of, you know, a great nation. That has actually happened long time ago. I mean, when you look at the political landscape, uh, you know, uh, you do not see, uh, you know, just try and consider that India is a federal uh, nation state, but even, you know, all the regions like states, they also compete with each other in order to attract investment, right? And uh, this is, and uh, I think, I think there is nearly all states in India, they have their own branding programs, investment programs to, to you know, so it's a, it's a container a big container which has many small containers within it. So what I'm trying to say is the ecological catastrophe or, you know, inequalities, those kind of concerns actually do not, they do not come from, uh, you know, left parties as such. At least they are not very vocal about it. What they come from, what we can term as independent left, activist groups, scholars. So there is a very different kind of, I don't know if he will agree with me, but this is my reading that I do not see in the political landscape that there is a very big push against this kind of economic uh, you know policy because even if you when you pay attention to people like Amartya Sen you know or Jean Dres uh, you know they have this argument uh, that uh, you know this idea of uncertain glory and uh, which basically speaks about economic growth and basically what they argue is that look yeah there is growth but there is not distribution so it is never, so here we are speaking about means and ends. So what they concentrate is not on the means, but how it is going to end, like whether it's going to be distributed or not. So in that sense, it is very difficult to pinpoint that within the Indian political landscape, where do you pin those neat categories of left and right? And which is why I think this thing about liberal markets, uh, you know, or illiberal politics, I mean, I, I, I find it difficult to just think in terms of left and right. Right. The, the couple of questions that come in, uh, one is asking you to, uh, Ravinda, to reflect on uh, whether psychoanalysis has anything to contribute here. Another one is the question, where do you place psychological propaganda in this uh, process you're talking about? Is that something you want to address? Or rather well, not. I don't know what, what to say because psychoanalysis, I mean, I think what we are speaking about is publicity or how you create a particular, you know, popular ground for certain things. But I would desist from talking about, you know, that people are being manipulated as such, right? Because if you speak to people, I think everybody likes to say, well, you know, I have my facts. You And you may, uh, you know, disagree what kind of facts you believe are right or wrong. But I think... Um, I, I don't know about psychoanalysis, uh, but certainly that uh, what we're speaking about, the spectacular politics that we're speaking about, that it does create a particular kind of public or publicness in this sphere. Yeah. 
All right. Can so I, I think quick, we, yes. Very, we have, wait, sorry. We can I just yeah. very quickly say something about this? Uh, yeah. Because I sort of foolhardily feel like this psychoanalysis question <laughs> sort of addresses me in some way. Uh, I mean, I think, look, I mean, the basic thing here is that Ravinder is talking about anxieties in the book, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the points about a psychoanalytic approach to politics is how are anxieties handled? Are anxieties handled in a mode of reassurance that uh, causes, as it were, the people who invest in a certain kind of leader or a certain kind of image to adopt a kind of regressive relationship to their own conflicts? Or are those conflicts being worked through in some other kind of way? And I think, you know, typically a psychoanalytic approach to hypernationalism would be to say the strong leader offers a kind of regressive compensation for your own internal conflicts and allows you to project those internal conflicts out onto some kind of other en enemy, whether it be another country or another ethnic group or another race or something like that. So that would be my short answer to that question. All right, thank you. So much. Very quickly, you know, Ravinder, on rereading the book this time around, I kept thinking of the question of desire, which also runs through, right? And in thinking about the question that you got uh, on psychoanalysis, I wonder if, you know, uh, how you would actually, quest, you know, tackle the question of the production of desire or the attempt to produce, make something seem desirable, right? if the tools of psychoanalysis or perhaps even a Lacanian analysis might produce a slightly different reading. I don't know, it's, it was just a question at the back of my head. All right, so... Uh, Can I jump in quickly, Thomas, on that last yeah. point? I just think it's a very powerful um, uh, qu question, the uh, place of psychic understandings or psychoanalytic models in, a, in the uh, ascendance of the muscular nationalism, or we can call it fascism, um, in comparative frames, the, when uh, attached to the brand new nations in, let's say, Brazil, you know, Turkey, um, the U.S., etc., the same kind of psychic structures. But um, so Ravinder's um, uh, analysis in the book, what it does is uh, move away, seems to me, from those earlier 20th century ways of understanding the psychology of the masses within entering fascism and so on, um, and towards um, a much more kind of uh, uh, complicated weave of uh, affect, desire, projection, all of these psychic structures, right? And, um, you also mentioned the kind of chronic inferiority complex that the third world nation has, all of these kind of psychic structures, but they get attached now very profoundly to the work of capital and capitalism and, uh, and the way that that defines the nation. So I would say, I, I'm not sure it's really an interesting point to think about um, that uh, the way in which um, uh, the psychic understanding of these global comparative, um, very, very disturbing rise of, of the right, um, uh, you know, it, it's time to, to it, it seems to me, Rizvinder's book places the um, argument on the table that it might be time to really rethink the ways that we've normally understood that historically. Thank you. So uh, I, uh, we had sort of agreed on a sort of 90 minute limit for this event. So I also want to wrap up within the next five minutes. Uh, is, is it okay with everybody if we take a couple more questions and then we wrap up? in your different time, so time zones? Yeah, okay. I think Satish, you, you're the one, you are in the evening. So um, um, there is a question from Mukulika Banerjee. Uh, uh, do you identify a sharp change in 2014 after which no other narrative about India, uh, or India is called anti-national? Uh, or do you see this brand new nation having started with the 1991 reforms? Uh, so I think, of, yes. So I think the story that I'm telling is the story of economic reforms, actually. And uh, of course, uh, it so happens that uh, we are in the time when BJP has won the second time round. So a lot of political analysis is mostly focused on uh, BJP or Modi as such. What I'm trying to show is, uh, you know, what is the prehistory of this moment in a way, or the longer history? And of course, I'm going, uh, you know, uh, longer 
back than 1990s reforms itself as such, right? So whole question of, uh, you know, how India becomes a commodity uh, by excellence. So I think uh, sometimes I feel that, uh, you know, that in our political analysis, when we think about 2014 as a kind of cutoff date, you know, uh, it poses some difficulty because uh, you can actually see the longer genealogies. Of course, something changes and that we all are aware of, we are confronted with. But we cannot understand what has taken place in 2014 or 2019 if we do not understand all the groundwork which has been laid. And this is what I also said a bit before, which is that um, the question, on, question of who's capitalizing who, uh, you know, at first sight it seems, and this was the promise that, uh, you know, BJP or Modi in its, uh, you know, current shape is going to, you know, like re-energize economy, you know. Because at that point, India is about to overtake China. But as we all know, it is now, you know, it is in dire straits. Uh, and what we do see is that there is a particular logic which has been laid, a particular formula of investment destination. And this is what BJP is capitalizing. So in order to understand what is being capitalized upon, then we have to perhaps move away from this, you know, 2014, which has literally become the center point of a lot of political analysis. So I try to avoid that because, uh, you know, like given my historical training, I'm very, very aware that we must not get caught up in the moment that we are because there is something before and there is something after. Our job is to look at the long lineages which bring us to any particular point. Sure. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? All right. So then I will take the last question, which is, came a little while ago from Sohail uh, uh, Rana. And um, it go, I'm just paraphrasing it here. Uh, coming back to what we discussed a little while ago, um, do you think, uh, uh, Sohail is asking that on one hand, the economic performance is, is one of the things that, that Modi has made very central to his uh, government. But even if that fails, uh, that might be many other because th there might be many there are many other things that are going on under the Modi regime. So uh, is this uh, given the the process? You uh, the way I understand the question. So Hale's question is that you're you're tracing a process of branding India that really has been going on since the 1990s, uh, and and in the current under the current regime is that being as it were instrumentalized to uh, to serve that much larger project of long standing which is the hindutva project that in some ways it, it there is a continuity but there is um, from from the 90s and there seems to be a certain consensus around some of these elite investments in this but now it seems that it's also serving this much longer project and maybe uh, is also marketed internally, as uh, Satish was talking about, and other people were talking about that that India's development is not really not about development as such as facts on the ground, but it's about this sort of particular idea that development uh, is part of this this uh, is part of the Indian nation and part of the Hindu nation. So perhaps I think one of the points that I've been trying to put forth uh, as to what capital does you know, in this new nation setting that we are speaking about is that uh, it creates, a, you know, a new kind of domestic space. You know, the notion of domestic, the sovereign state which occupies the domestic sphere. And the ways in which it works is that, uh, you know, the investment model that uh, countries or investors who are interested in doing business in India you know, there are the, you know, spoken or unspoken exchanges this that you keep out of what we call inter internal affairs of the nation, right? That we don't want to bother you with this. Uh, we are just here to do business. And this is what you will hear most businessmen, business people, investors, uh, this is how they will speak about. But of course, this is not the way it happens. What happens is that there is an entire domestic sphere which is produced, which can be rearranged. 
And that rearrangement is something that we are witnessing every single day. I mean, it has just happened last year with 5th August in Kashmir. It is happening with how textbooks are produced. Or many, there are so many examples of how this domestic rearrangement is taking place or how you know, inward expansion is taking place. You know? So I think the latest example, uh, I think last week or 10 days ago, everyone was petrified about listening about what Facebook is doing. There was a Wall Street Journal report and it was, it was shocking, right? But not really. When you see that the kind of bargain which is being made is, well, allow us to do business here, we will do your bidding. So in that sense, I think uh, the, the way to think about politics is to think about the intersections, uh, you know, of how this internal, external, you know, how the domestic space and the foreign space or the ways in which foreign can work to produce the domestic sphere as well. Okay, anyone else who want to weigh in on that or should we uh, wrap up? Okay. I think there are a lot of questions. Maybe what we can do is to post them online when we post the video, because it has yeah. been uh, impossible to uh, answer all those questions. There are 27 different comments and questions, some of them to all of us, some of them just here in the Q&A. Uh, thank you everybody to everybody who asked a question and thank you all for your participation in this. And uh, a big congratulations to Ravinda um, thank you very much. All right. Uh, we wrap up here. Uh, go well and uh, um, all the best. We'll see you somewhere in the future in the flesh. Thank you, right? Thomas. Congratulations, Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All all right. Thank you. Bye.